good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so my name is Meher. I'm a sales representative at Solid Experience. And today with me, I have Michael Prioriello. Uh, Michael works as a solutions engineer at Solid Experience and has extensive knowledge in the 3D design simulation in the transport industry, as well as aerospace and civil engineering. Uh, so Michael will now take over and present us with the different tools offered by DASO for generative design. At the end of the presentation, uh, we'll have a little Q&A period, and uh, I would ask you just to either uh, ent enter it in the chat, that way we can answer your questions at the end. Uh, but before I pass it over to Michael, I just wanted to give a little recap on what generative design software is. So generative design software uh, it autonomously creates optimal designs from a set of system design requirements. Engineers can interactively uh, specify their requirements and goals, including preferred materials and manu manufacturing processes. Uh, and the generative engine will automatically produce a manufacturer ready design as a starting point or as a final solution. As a result, engineers can interact with the technology to create superior designs and drive product and in innovation more quickly. So Michael, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, so uh, I'd like to just start this full screen. Okay, so as, as mentioned, uh, my name is Michael Piriello. I'm a junior, uh, junior engineer at uh, Solid Experience. I'm a solutions engineer. I've uh, worked in Mechanica for uh, over three years and I have excellent knowledge in uh, 3D experience, GATIA, SOLIDWORKS, design and simulation. So benefits of using the, three, uh, the generative part design in the 3D, in the 3D experience environment. <clears throat> so uh, we have the ability to modify designs, add revisions, recalculate all from one place. You don't have to export to another uh, um, design app to run your simulation and then re-import to modify and then re-export and so on and so on. Uh, it could decrease the weight and design time without having to affect the functional design space. So we could choose our our, uh, our functional parameters, then um, uh, go inside and optimize uh, certain areas without having to ha while freezing other areas. And uh, you could easily modify designs for manufacturability or 3D printing or 3D printing work without. Um, And uh, we also have, using 3D experience, we also have the ability to run server-based calculations as well as local calculations. So I could run um, the, the um, I could run the optimization on my physical laptop or computer or run or set it all up on my computer and then save it and run it on a server overnight. Let's say for a longer simulation, I'll set it up overnight, come back into work the next day and it'll be done. And then this also allows you to work on other things since we know simulation tasks do to take a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of performance away from the computer. So the functional driven, the fun, function driven uh, generative designer role provides an um, integrated work environment while we're using structural simulation with the Tosca solver within Simulia. Gives a uh, topology optimized shape with all within the same software. So like we said, we could design, um, optimize and, and, uh, and, design, optimize, have a result, and then re-optimize, so on and so forth. So an example we'll do after, we're gonna optimize uh, th this part we see at the top uh, right-hand side. The legacy part would have a um, weight of uh, 700 grams, and then you optimize shape using the Tosca solver within Simulia. We'll have a new weight of 295 grams while still maintaining the same stiffness, while still maintaining the same stiffness, and, and the overall performance of the part. So essentially, we're just uh, getting rid of the non-essential material within the part. So we're gonna go through, uh, most optimizations take seven steps to optimize. Um, it's for sure, if, if you start adding in thermal conditions and um, and, and, and and various setups while using, a, uh, let's say a CNC mill or casting and, and, and stuff like that, we'll, you'll be able to add in more steps in here, but these are the basic seven steps for any um, for any um, um, optimization. 
So the, the the first thing we need to do is import a part either from an assembly or an existing database within the 3D Experience platform, or we can just open up a part that we have been working on and start uh, and start the optimization from within the part. Then the next thing we have to do is make sure to uh, use Katia to add a, uh, the maximum amount of material within the part. So basically, we'll have our design space and we'll add in the maximum possible material for the entire motion of of this part. So as we saw in, this, in, in the previous slides, uh, it was, it was it's, a, it's a bracket attached to an arm, so we'll, we'll simulate the like the full like the min and maximum uh, rotation of, of the engine on 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 the on on the on the plane essentially, and we'll add in the maximum possible material, as you can see in Figure Two from Figure One. So from there, uh, we want to apply the the necessary materials. So in this example, we'll be using titanium. So uh, also one thing to mention is if we are doing a thermal uh, a thermal simulation, you want to have in uh, temperature values within um, through the experience in, defined inside your, your material. So uh, next thing we'll do is we'll apply frozen, frozen regions within the part. So in this part here, the purple uh, the, the the purple volumes you see are volumes that will not be touched. So in this case, you'll have a bearing surface in the middle, you have four bolt holes, and our positioning ring at the bottom. So the, these areas over here will not be optimized, and they will stay exactly as is. So in in this case, let's say our bolt needs a radius of four millimeters in order to be uh, in order to structurally adhere the the part to uh, to, to another part. We'll be able to add in, uh, let's say, don't touch four millimeters. On the radius of, of, of the bolt. So next thing we want to do is define uh, loads, load cases, restraints, thermal conditions if we have any, and connections to simulate real world lo real world loading. So in this case, like I said, we'll have four bolts. We could also, excuse me, we could also add in the maximum axial and shear stiffness of each bolt, and and radiuses. We could also add in different head sizes. So in this case, we have hex heads. Uh, we could add in a countersunk, or, or depending on the way the uh, the hole is made. Um, excellent. So the next uh, after that, we could uh, we, we can mesh the, the the actual part, and we could validate our setup. So validation is a uh, is something important that, that we do in in through the experience that a lot of other um, uh, simulation platforms do not. This basically goes through your your setups, all your loads, load cases, uh, thermal conditions, your your, uh, your your temperatures, and verifies if everything is 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 present. So if something is missing, so let's say you're doing a thermal analysis, but you don't have any thermal values inside, it'll tell you, hey, you're missing um, uh, thermal conditions before you start like before you start to run the simulation, because as we all know, once you're four or five hours inside a simulation. And then it just pops up an error. Hey, you have no thermal values. You just sort of wasted time. So this this basically provides like like a quick um, uh, a quick validation to make sure you have all your all your inputs within 3D experience before you click run. So next uh, next thing you want to do is specify your uh, constraints related related to performance under loads. Uh, geometry and manufacturing so in this case uh, in, in the particular example we're going to do after we want to we want to use it to 3d print what you want to 3d print it so in our case we'll have a maximum i'm oh, sorry we'll have a, a minimum member thickness so we don't want a member of let's say uh, 0.5 millimeters so because, because then well, as you're 3d printing it it'll cave in on itself or same thing with machining you don't want a member too thin because as you're as you're machining it down um you, you, it'll break off so, so depending on the type of machines you have, uh, you could set in a minimum and maximum thickness. In our case, for this particular part, we don't want to set the maximum uh, uh, thickness. We want to have the, the best optimized model with the most weight uh, removed. So uh, with, with this particular scenario also, as you can see, it's basically symmetrical around two planes. So in order to have a faster simulation, we could uh, only we only have to simulate one. Well, I mean, this, the software only has to simulate one quarter of this, and then combine the results. So this will uh, greatly exponentially reduce the amount of time spent um, um, optimizing this particular case. But we could also have a symmetry along one plane, two planes, or even three planes. 
Uh, next the thing we want to do is op uh, to optimize to, uh, to to specify the optimization target. So we want to specify, let's say, a 15% mass reduction. So at 15% mass reduction, it'll just stop calculating. So in, in this case here, in the example that I, I set a, um, I, I I set my predetermined conditions where it's to say 15% um, a 15% material minimum. 15% of the mass minimum, and I, I could do a, a, a cycle time. So cycles is basically the amount of iterations it does before it stops. So in this case here is the graph we see. Uh, I, I had set the maximum of 60, but once you start getting onto your, um, uh, once your curve starts leading into the, like like the horizontal area, as we see, it, it'll it'll automatically stop calculating. So in our, uh, in the example we'll do later on, I think it stops calculating at around 30 or, or, or 33 cycles. So even though you set a, a higher number of cycles, once it, it starts getting that it can't be optimized more than this, it'll automatically stop. So you don't have to waste unnecessary time. So after that, uh, so after we do the optimization, we'll want to reanalyze our new optimized um, part. Uh, th this will ensure that we, we have our expected we have our expected results. And then from here, we could uh, let's say if we wanted to add material or change the, the uh, like change some holes. Like change the diameter of holes or change some positionings w without having to go and re-optimize everything. We could change it from here and then just reanalyze these new pieces. So from here, if you're happy with your part or if you modify it, then after, after you're happy with your part, you could export it uh, in various formats like STP for 3D printing. So now we'll go through an example within 3D Experience. Uh, so our example was the one to optimize an aerospace bracket used to mount an aircraft engine to a frame structure. So I'm just gonna switch to the 3D experience. Um, give me one second. So I'll, I'll also turn off my, uh, my webcam so you'll be able to see everything full screen. import the part or search for it then open it. We'll have here a joiner part as we mentioned before in our slide. First thing we want to do is import the part or search for it then open it. We'll have here a joiner part as we mentioned before in our slide. <clears throat> One thing to, to, to note is that we have a material that includes a simulation domain. It also includes a drafting domain and the appearance rendering domain that this, this is needed. So first we'll we have our design space here with all our uh, parts and, and, and features that, that we created. So we'll take this design space and we'll copy it. Well, actually we'll first be active inside the 3D shape or continue. So we'll take this design space, we'll copy it and we'll paste it inside the 3D shape. And we'll paste the as result with link. Next, we'll rename this design space to partitions. Partitions. And click OK. Now, from this, we could hide the whole design space. And now we have a new solid, single solid. 
which is a single volume. So in order to create a functional volume, we have to split this volume into several subvolumes. These partitions will not be touched during our optimization process. They will basically be frozen. So first we'll apply a partition. Actually, before we do that, first we'll make sure that we are in the functional generative design app. Um, we can, it's available in the function generated designer role and function generated designer. So uh, if you're already in it, it'll open up a new part. So we'll just close this without saving. Now, now since we're already inside the app, we'll click on a design study and click on partition design space. So next we'll select preserve faces by offset, which is already selected. Then we'll select the face. So here we'll want to click on the bearing surface. We'll click on this. And from here, we want to, we want to preserve five millimeters outside in the radius the right in the in like five millimeters from basically from here to here so we'll click that we'll click preview it'll show you a preview and we'll click okay and this will split the volume as you can see here it'll it split it from the original uh, part next we we'll want to split the volume for the bolt holes for the bolt holes there are four bolts as you can see here so we'll click on partition space. We'll select the first bolt hole and we'll change the offset to four millimeters and click preview. Next, you know, now I could either, I could also just select all the, the remaining three uh, bolt holes or I could be lazy and click on the add all cylindrical faces. This will automatically select all the faces, all the cylindrical faces However, it'll also select the faces that we've already selected. So in this case, I want to deselect the center bearing face here and this face at the bottom, which we haven't looked at yet. So I'll click the plus button, scroll to the top, and I'll find this face is this one. This face is the middle one, so this one I'll want to delete. And we'll want to delete this bottom one here, face 77. I'll we'll just click on delete there. As you can see in our preview, it preserves four millimeters around all four bolt holes. From this, we'll just click OK. Next, we'll want to make a split of our bottom surface here, which will later be made for locating this part. So we'll click on partition design space, then we'll click on, and so we'll click on partition design space, then we'll select this face. So we want to select this face over here. Actually, no, sorry about that. So, I want to preserve by a splitting plane. Click splitting plane here. And now we'll select the XY plane. So, this will automatically preserve everything lower than the XY plane. Click preview and click OK. So, now we have our three partitions. Petition for our locating piece, our petition for our bolts, and our petition for our bearing load in the middle. So from here, we'll click on topology optimization. Next, we'll click on create new optimization. Here we could give it a name a simulation name and a topology optimization simulation name. For now, I'll leave it at default. In the topology optimization, we could maximize stiffness for a given mass, or it could minimize mass while respecting constraints, or could maximize lower the lowest frequencies for a given mass. For this particular optimization, we'll maximize stiffness for a given mass. Click there and we'll click create. So once the optimization is created. You'll see a, a window here on the right side. This can be moved around. Click on here, we can move it around anywhere we want, or we could just clip it back in. So from this, our design exploration is divided into three categories. We have our design space analysis, the optimization case, and shape validations. And we'll go through these um, in the minutes to come. 
So the first thing to do is spec specify the parts to be optimized. So we'll click on model configuration. And we want to we want to optimize this design space we created earlier with the three individual partitions. So we'll just click on it and click on OK. So next, we have to select the regions to preserve. So we'll click on region to preserve. And all the regions to preserve will be in this in, in this color. And the regions to optimize will be in this in this uh, white uh, greenish pattern. So we could see just to confirm, volume one is in fact this year. And you also have it separated by weight of each partition. And the weight is given by the the calculation of the density inside our our um, our material that we previously applied. So once we selected what, what we want to preserve, we'll click on OK. Next, we'll want to apply four connections for bolts. So we'll click on the connections on the model. We'll click on new and we'll click on bolt. So next, we'll apply, we'll click on support one, make sure it's highlighted. If you select that again, like I just did, even if you click anything, it won't, it won't be added inside the support. So we'll make sure it's selected like this. We'll also make sure this is a standard bolt. There are other options. So we'll just click standard bolt and we'll select this edge over here. Now for the axial stiffness, we'll add an axial stiffness of one E positive eight. And you don't have to worry about units. The second you click outside, it'll automatically add the default units. So here we want to select the bolt radius of six millimeters and we'll click OK. So this adds a one virtual bolt. So from this, we could, as we did before, we could select each bolt individually, or I could select on this bolt. I could click on tools. About that. Click on tools and click bolt replication. Now we could click find bolts. This will look for all the diameters that match the diameter we just selected. So it's found three extra ones, list them over here. So we'll click on OK. And it automatically apply for the three remaining virtual bolts. Like I said, if we just select a new and click new bolt three times, that, that would have also done the same thing. Now we noticed an error, so I'll just double click here. I believe I forgot to. Yeah, I have to add in a shear stiffness as well. So I'll just add that in there real quick. Add this for all of them. Shear and okay. Okay, so now we're good. So next, we'll want to add in two bearing loads on the bearing surface that we created earlier. So we'll add loads, new, and we'll add a bearing load. Now in this case, we'll create two individual bearing load. This will help us with load cases later on. Or we could have, if, if we just were doing one load case, we could have just put in both X and Y forces right away. So for now, I'll input my bearing selection, the middle, I'll input my force in the X direction to 25,015 Newtons. And I'll click OK. And I'll create a new bearing load in the Y direction of 40,980 Newtons. And we'll click on this surface here. Now we'll click on OK. And we'll click on OK. So our loads are added. Next, we'll click on restraints. So in this case, we want to add a new fixed displacement to this face here. So we'll click on the face, we'll click on no translation in X and Y, and click on OK. And OK to confirm. So during a 
uh, during the life of a design, it could go through different types of loading conditions. We could group the loads and the restraints into load caches that will ensure that the uh, loads and constraints required for analysis are applied in the setup. So load cases are groups of uh, loads and restraints that are used in a particular load case. In this load case, we'll have a uh, three load cases, one in the negative, oh, sorry, one in the positive X, one in the positive Y, and one in the negative Y. I'll click on load cases. We'll create three new load cases. They all have the same fixed displacement we saw earlier. Our first one has the X direction. Second one has a again, positive X direction. And the last one we'll put in as a negative one direction. We could also put in a two over here. And this would have just multiplied the load case by two. Just not have to go in and change the original load. For now, we'll just leave it as one. And we'll click OK. Once all the boundary conditions are applied, we can configure the mesh. So click on uh, Setup Validation. And then we'll click on Configure Mesh. And we'll just show the expert options here. Next, we'll divide the geometry into small geometrical shapes called elements, which is called meshing. Meshing breaks up the domain into pieces which, which, will, which will be analyzed. Using 3D, 3D experience, we can configure the mesh, the type, and the order. In this case, we'll select our mesh to 3.3 millimeters. A smaller mesh means better quality, which will give better results. However, we'll have a longer time to compute and it could be more expensive. A larger mesh means lower quality and uh, however, faster to compute and less expensive, but will also be less accurate. For the type, we have two types, a tetrahedron mesh and an octo, uh, octatree tetrahedron mesh. The tetrahedron type will start from the outer surface of the geometry and will mesh it and then move its way towards the inside of the mesh will be filled with linear or quadratic tetrahedrons. The octatree tetrahedron creates a mesh of tetrahedron elements extending outward from the center of the model into the outer surface. For the order, we have two types of orders, the linear and quadratic. The linear order is a first, first order elements that have nodes only at their corners in the shape of a square based pyramid. So four nodes and six edges. However, uh, could the quadratic order, the second order elements have nodes in between the nodes of the linear type. So you'll have 10 nodes total. So the same uh, four, no, four out the side nodes, plus some additional nodes in between those existing nodes. So you'll have 10 nodes and the same six edges. So for us, we'll leave linear and tetrahedron. And we'll click OK. Now before running the simulation or the validation, we want to click verify. This will verify that all our loads and restraints and load cases make sense. So we'll click verify. Once the verification is complete, you'll have a little model scenario check status box. We'll just click on close. So now we are ready to run the setup validation once it's been verified. So we'll go ahead and click on run. So here we'll just choose the type of, of, uh, of validation. So here we'll want to use all four cores. If we're doing other stuff while this is happening, we'll obviously want to lower the cores that we're using. But these are physical cores. So on this machine, I have four cores, hyper-threaded to eight. This will use all four cores. And these are just the, for the license, we'll just choose embedded. And click OK. Once the analysis is complete, we'll have a validation status completed window. We could just click close on that. From here, we have our scale, our displacement scale. And uh, we'll change this. So this displacement scale for our, the first load case, you can see the other load cases. And we'll go ahead and change to the von Mises stress. 
example here, we also have a deformation scale at the bottom. This means this is a deformation scale of 79, 79 times. So it doesn't actually bend this much in real life. So this is for the first load case. The model is considered to be safe if the von Mises stress is below the elastic limit of the material. After the elastic limit, we'll have plastic deformation and it's no longer safe. So now we are ready for the optimization. So we'll click on the optimized constraints. So here we can specify a shape control to model the topology for the manufacturing aspect. In our case, we want to model it for 3D printing. So we'll want to add a thickness control and we can add a, a shape shape control. So first we'll start with the thickness control. The thickness control option allows us to specify the minimum or maximum thickness of any member and the resulting conceptual shape. The minimum member size must be larger than the mesh size and the maximum thickness must be greater than two times the minimum mesh size. So for us, we'll just want to specify a minimum thickness of eight millimeters, and we'll leave the maximum thickness to unlimited. It'll compute on its own. I will click OK. Next, we want to specify the shape control. Shape control essentially uh, will, because this part is symmetrical, it, and it's symmetrical about the Z, Z X plane and the Y Z plane, we'll only have to compute one quarter of this part. This will allow us to have a faster simulation. So we'll add a second optimization constraint of shape control. We'll click new and we'll click on symmetry. So next we'll add, we'll click in our plane, the YZ plane. And the order is, is not important. We'll click on okay. And we'll add our second symmetry control to be the ZX plane. We'll click on that and we'll click on okay. The next I'll go ahead and just hide these. Actually, we'll click on okay here and then we'll rehide these two planes. So now we're ready for the topology optimization. So we'll click on topology optimization. And one thing I want to point out is only the setups with numbers next to them are required. So in this case, we don't have to put in um, optimization constraints and we don't have to put in thermal conditions. So for our particular case, we want to maximize stiffness for a given mass. We'll set it to 15% of the target mass of the design space. So here we'll change this value to 15%. Now our mesh options, our mesh options are the same as we as we configured earlier. You can see here, the same. We'll leave that as 3.3 millimeters for now. And we could click verify, but in this case, we know what's correct. So we'll just click on run. So here, like before, we'll want to select embedded and four cores. And we'll set a number of cycles to 60. We could also set a show live monitor. So this will basically allow us to see the, uh, the optimization live. So now we could click OK. And this will run the optimization. So once the optimization is complete, we'll have a finished window. We'll click close on this. Now we can generate the shape and validate it structurally. So we'll click on concept generation. Here we'll click on, so here we have the new shape. So we'll click on, uh, let's have this. So this is the highlighted in black is the old shape. If we move the slider back and forth, we could see the cutting value. So here we'll wanna set a cutting value of 80%. And here we could see the relative mass and mass numbers updated. 
and everything. We want to add an output type A of a standard smooth subdivision. And then now we could hit generate. So now we could click on finish. So next we'll want to perform a concept validation to verify that the optimization was, was done correctly and has the output expected results. So we'll click on concept validation. Now we'll click on new shape validation. Just like this, we'll click on apply. And we'll click on the new shape validation and we'll click on open case. Now an analysis case is created and all the inputs and boundary conditions are automatically added that we added before. So if we click on loads, we'll have the loads that we put in before, we'll have the restraints, load cases, connections, and all the models. So from here, we'll click on run, and this will rerun the analysis that we ran before with the new optimized model. We don't have to select anything here. We could change the mesh. And we can verify, but we know it's correct. So we'll just click on run. So here, like before, we'll click on four cores and click on OK. So once, once the analysis is complete, we'll have a, a finished window. We'll click on close here. Here again, we could see the von Mises stress for load case one. We could switch to load case two and load case three. And we could see other types like deformation and displacement. Now, once this is completed, we can go ahead and export. So we'll click on, double click here to go back to the 3D shape. Have our 3D shape here. This is the final concept shape. So from here, we can click on share and export. And from this, we could export it into a, a 3D printer to be 3D printed. All right, yes, I believe that concludes the uh, presentation on this topic. Uh, actually, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, Michael, are you ready? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we have one question here. Uh, so can we have two optimizations, uh, one for 3D printing and one for manufacturing uh, so that we can easily compare the results? Uh, yeah, so uh, let me just uh, transfer over to uh, through the experience over here. I'll even turn on my webcam once more. Yeah, so uh, if you go on optimize constraints on the right hand side, we could click on uh, manufacturing control. And from that, we could have um, essentially our, our different parameters for let's say a CNC, so let's say a CNC mill or a, or, or, or a cast in, uh, or a, a piece that's gonna be casted or et cetera. And uh, from here, we could have one optimization with our, our manufacturing control and then have our second optimization um, like, like, like we just did here for um, 3D printing, and we'll be able to see all the results in the design tree on the side. So here we have uh, optimization. Um, so this one, it's result of optimization technology. Uh, op sorry, result of technology optimization, excuse me. Case one, then we can have case two, case three, case four, case five, so on and so forth. Then we can name them all individually. So we'll be able to qu quickly see if we want to go to our, um, let's say our superiors or our clients, so on and so forth. We could just quickly switch between each one of them. Uh, so yeah. It, is there any other questions? Or, okay, or yeah, uh, we have one more here. Uh, so the question is, can we go and modify the design without having to reconfigure all the loads? Uh, yeah, so uh, in essence, what happens is uh, when, when, you, when you put in the loads here, they get, uh, um, as you put in a load, it'll, it'll basically link the load separately from the surface. So if you wanna just change the surface later on, you, you could do that. So in, in, in our case, when we created our design space, so we have, let's say, our initial design 
in, in the tree. So let's say I imported this part from, um, uh, let's say, like in our case, I imported it from assembly, but it, in the assembly, it was just linked as one uh, as one piece. So from so let's say here, if I uh, were to unhide this and hide this, so so this was our original part. So then from that, I added a new a new design space. Uh, let's say unhide this and hide this one, and I added the maximum amount of material. And then from that, I made all my, all my all my modifications according to my the, the maximum condition. Then I took all this and I linked it inside a second uh, a, a second design space over here, as you can see, solved 14. This is linked to this design space. So any modification that I made in here will be linked uh, will be linked over here. And if I were to create a let's say design space two. I could just transfer the link from uh, solid for like solid 14 now is linked to design space. So I'll be able to transfer the solid 14 link instead of from design space, it'll be design space two. And then all, all everything with design space two will automatically be linked there. And I'll just have to click update and uh, it should automatically find all the, all the surfaces if they weren't changed of, of uh, where all the loads were and where all the restraints were. If some of the surfaces were changed, we could go inside and then and, and modify um, uh, and, and just have to modify the surface and it'll re-put, uh, so let's say in loads, so I would modify the, the bearing surface here and it would automatically uh, uh, compute everything else right after. So you would ha have your first uh, uh, analysis, you'd have the optimization and you'd have the second analysis. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, I believe that sums up our questions for this uh, for this webinar. So I'd like to thank all of you for participating. Thank you, Michael, for uh, presenting all the information. Uh, we hope we provided you with interesting information and answer all your questions. Of course, if you do have any questions that come up later, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, send us an email. We're more than happy to help. Uh, this webinar will be on our website soon, so if ever you want to recap and look it over again, it's going to be available soon. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Don't hesitate to reach out and have yourself a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day.